Hello and welcome to the Disruptive Technologists webinar on the metaverse featuring Esther Dyson and Graham Moorhead. Now I'd like to introduce you to Seth DiMaglio, who's the Accessibility Insights PM at Microsoft and is also our MC. Take it away, Seth. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Lauren. Hello, Disruptors. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as we all might know, the Disruptive Technologists mission is to encourage young women to pursue careers in technology. Disruptive Technologists is a STEM nonprofit with a mission to educate, inspire, and empower a community of diverse disruptors, including women and people of all backgrounds through a variety of platforms. We'd like to quickly say thanks to a few of our sponsors and supporters over the years, Esther Dyson, Ramona Wright, Greg King, Jeff Paul, Scott Moss, um, and then to enter, we also have a, a, a little giveaway today, and to enter our email lottery for a chance to win an empowering entrepreneurial books by Rebecca Costa and a two-day Upflex office space passes from Ginger Dill Wall. Um, you can just send your name, title, and company and email address to info at disruptivetechnologists.com. I'll post that in the chat as well. We're still processing the entries from the last two webinars, so you will be you'll be hearing by the end of the month on those windows. We only have a short time to address um, chat questions, but feel free to ask them. And our team expert, Bruce um, Epstein, the AI content expert, will follow up later in a post to our members that answers any questions we weren't able to get to during the Zoom today. We have a one hour um, to discuss the metaverse led by our moderator. Frank Levine, and he's a data scientist, blogger, podcaster, and quantum developer working his way through the metaverse. He's mm -hmm. currently works as head of cloud services or in global GTN leader at Red Hat. And formerly, he was the data and AI tech architect at Microsoft. So I'm going to hand it over to you now, Frank, and I'll also post that email address for the giveaway. Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Uh, I do indeed have a red hat right there. So, um, but this isn't about red hat or anything that we do. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the metaverse. And metaverse is something that I've been kind of fascinated with for a number of years. I remember playing around with VRML. I think I was in college when I saw the Lawnmower Man. So that, I was kind of captured by that idea, even though generally that's a terrible movie. Uh, but um, ultimately, I think that uh, there's been a lot of movement in this space of recent uh, years. The term metaverse actually comes from a Neil Stevenson novel called Snow Crash, which is about kind of the virtual version of the Internet. And it was imagined 30 some odd years ago. And I recently reread the book. And in some ways, it gets a lot of things right in terms of how most commerce happens on the Internet. And uh, there's a global network there. Now, obviously, Facebook has rebranded themselves now as Meta, and they are uh, in the middle of a, a major transition because their major platform, what made Facebook Facebook, is starting to lose uh, active users. So, th is this a is this a desperate play to remain relevant, or is there something to this? Is there something behind this? Um, so with us, we have two uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, first is Esther Dyson, who's the executive founder of Wellview, uh, a 10-year nonprofit project focused on helping five small U.S. communities increase equitable well-being and to serve as a model for others. She's a noted angel investor focusing on IT, internet, policy, health, logistics, insurance, space travel, among other interesting areas. And she served as a founding chairman of ICANN, uh, one of the first internet governance organizations from 1998 to 2000, and has remained on has remained on its board for a few years thereafter, focused on the at-large community. Our second panelist is Graham Moorhead, principal research scientist and A O A A O N, an adjunct pro professor at Gonzaga University. He's been on the cutting edge of technologies in a wide array of disciplines, from high energy physics to complex adaptive systems and automatic translation. Welcome, Esther and Graham. How's it going this evening? Fantastic. Very well, thank you. Awesome, awesome. So, in a word, Esther, what's your, what is the metaverse? Is it, is it, is, is there something to it? What, what's, what do you think the, the, uh, is there meat behind this? Uh, and if you're vegan, is there an impossible word? Yeah, um, it's, it's a real phenomenon. You know, it's, it's a. 
it's basically the notion of spending more and more of your life online versus in quote real life. Uh, there's still things you can't really do very well online, like eat. Uh, you know, we we can simulate a lot of stuff. We can figure out how to transmit smells or create them locally. Um, but you know, the metaverse is whatever you want to make of it. It's it's everything from you know fancy dress parties. It's NFTs. It's all virtual things. You can make a metaverse. You can make a prison metaverse. You can make a rose garden metaverse. You can make an exploring Mars metaverse. So you're going to have trouble eliminating as much gravity as you want. Uh, so the real question is how how are these things going to be governed? And here I think we're seeing a lot of hand waving and you know oh we'll take care of it, but you know we can't even do it on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, we get into huge arguments IRL. And I think the problem with the metaverse is going to be the human beings inhabiting it, whether they're real human beings or human created bots. Uh, I, I just think we need to get much more serious about really understanding what the issues are. And after, you know, when Graham and I get talking, I hope to talk a little bit about my experience with ICANN, which in a sense, was a regulatory body for some part of you know, the very first metaverse, which was the internet as a whole. And, 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 and the internet, particularly back then, I, I do want to dive into that. Uh, you know, you were the founding chair of ICANN and uh, I mean, decentralized governance almost sounds like an oxymoron. How, how does that work? Because it sounds like a lot of cat herding to me. Oh, well, I mean, if you, how does it work? It's decentralized. Um, will it ever exist? I have no idea. I mean, again, I'd, I'd love to bring Graham in and then we can we can talk about right. what went wrong, you know, and what went right with ICANN um, and what people, you know, I don't, how shall I say, ICANN is not quite as famous as, you know, the American Revolution. I'm not sure how many people have studied it in the first place. And you know, it certainly had some utility, but I wouldn't say it was a rating success. And I can explain why. Fair enough. All right, Graham, what are your thoughts on, on the metaverse? Is this, a, is this a real thing? Is this marketing hype? Is, it, is, is there substance behind the words? So the word itself, I would say, is just the newest word that we have as a buzzword to refer to everything virtual. Um, I also applaud your, the fact that you read Snow Crash, and I'd like to bring up the fact that in Snow Crash, they talk about how the brains of programmers were different because they spent all that time programming, and then they were then susceptible to this image that if they saw it, it would break their actual brain out in the real world. And there's a connection between that and adversarial AI, where you show a strange image to an AI and it breaks the AI. We have that in AI, but we don't have that in, you know, real brains yet. And hopefully well, we, we won't. We, I mean, epileptic seizures can be triggered yes. by and Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So we are seeing some of that merging there. Um, and Esther, I'm very happy to finally do something with you. Um, you have contributed to at least one project that I've been an advisor to and grateful to have your assistance on that. And I admire you. Um, anyway, more about the metaverse. I'd say it is a clean training ground for AI. Think about what it takes to teach an AI what an object is or what a shape is or what a surface is or a texture. In the real world, you have to be able to reference that thing and you can't get it exactly. If you look at training data for Tesla, for instance, they will have bounding boxes around other cars and bicyclists and things in the road, but these bounding boxes are not perfect and they're certainly not references to perfectly shaped volumes in the real world. In the metaverse, we can do that though. In the metaverse, every object can be perfectly defined 
And then you can show an AI what it looks like from different perspectives and teach it how to understand what that object is. It is in a sense, that, that's the simplest way I would put it. Synthetic the data, perfect, in other words. The, the perfect yeah. training ground but, for yeah. a child AI. But then what do you do when the AI goes out into the real world and you know there's a car missing a headlight or something and it says, oh, this isn't a perfect car. Yeah. I mean, the world is imperfect. And so in a sense, the metaverse is misleading. That's actually yeah, an interesting yeah. point, Esther. Um, if the world is imperfect, should the metaverse be imperfect? If you want to train AI, it should. It's not should or shouldn't, but just, you know, understand if you're trying to train an AI, what's, what's much more interesting is, well, is a one-legged man really a man? If you've been taught it has two legs. Uh, and... You know, I mean, the, the, the great thing about humans, I think, is creativity in a sense is a mistake. Metaphors are a mistake. Uh, you know, it's, it's the ability to see things that are not quite the same as the same that kind of gives humans a lot of their, the, the capacity for error and for recovery from error. Interesting. So let's talk about your experience with ICANN because I think we kind of opened that up with that. Uh, how, okay. how, how, how effective is decentralized government? How does it actually govern? Well, ICANN is not decentralized. Oh. Um, so, I mean, just a little bit of history. ICANN was created sort of in mostly 1998. The John Postel, who had been kind of running, you know, the the basic server for the domain name system and the IP address system of the internet. And that was a centralized thing though it had you know, a, a number of mirror sites. Um, he got annoyed about something or other, I forget the details and you know, shut it down for three or four hours. And the, uh, you know, the people who cared, basically the people at the ARPANET in the US, and the US government and the EU said, wow, we can't you know, just let this crazy man keep running this thing. Uh, to the internet community, John Postel was kind of a living saint. And so they basically kind of got him to agree that there should be a decentralized internet government. And so there was a supposedly immaculate conception of the internet community coming together to create this thing they would call ICANN. But it was really pretty much a, a joint project of the EU and the US governments. And then they invited in Japan uh, to keep the kind of the Asian side happy. And then I, I think there were six or seven people on the board. Anyway, it, it was, they sort of pretended it was the internet community, but it, it really wasn't. Meanwhile, the business community said, we don't need no stinking regulation. The, the Japanese kind of said, let us in and then we'll let you regulate it. The uh, internet people said, is this for real? And anyway, it, it happened. And then, and so John Postel being the saint was gonna be chairman of it, but he died in September of that year, just before ICANN was formally constituted. He died of basically complications after heart surgery or something like that. And so the, the actual real force behind ICANN was basically a corporate litigating firm. Uh, and you know, they, they wanted a board of people who were not really internet savvy. Vint Cerf and I and this, a guy from Japan called Jun Mirai were, you know, internet users, whatever. The rest of them were supposed to be nonpartisan people and they didn't really know too much about the internet. One was a kind of fierce Dutchman who complained about open meetings and said, well, if we have these open meetings, we'll just decide everything at dinner the night before. Uh, which he said in an open forum. 
that wasn't very helpful. So our first task was really to break up the monopoly of um, network solutions, which was the registry for the, the dot .com domain. And we had really insufficient budget to do that. There was a troll called Jeff Williams and a couple of other people who were by network solutions. And that kind of took all our energy, but we did in fact break up that monopoly and we, we created kind of a more fair commercial system. Our real job was to basically keep the governments from trying to take, from getting control of this thing. So what we were supposed to do is protect a vacuum. And I would say we were very successful in doing that. I mean, even now, the internet still operates both in Ukraine and Russia. And believe me, ICANN has been talking about that. Uh, but the general consensus, I would say, is let's keep them both on there. Ultimately, the internet is a force for good. You, you can use it for propaganda, but God knows if you don't have it, things get worse. So don't cut off, you know, I would say Russia is kind of, it's a country with a huge cancer at the top. Uh, but there's still the Russian people at the bottom. And our trick is to kill the cancer without killing the patient. And keeping the internet alive in Russia is probably the best way to do it. Anyway, so they, they did save the internet from the governments, but it's basically become sort of a commercial protection racket. Uh, you know, hey, nice name.com domain you have there. Now we need to, you know, your restaurant's really great. Now we need to name.io, name.net, name.org, name. We're gonna protect not just your restaurant, but every room in your restaurant, every table in your restaurant, and it's gonna cost you, but you know, you get to keep the restaurant. And so they, they so, took our money, but not our voice. So there's a lot to unpack in, in that statement. Yeah. Uh, uh, from geopolitics to just good old fashioned trademark law. Um, uh, personally, I kind of, I, I, I might take the counter opinion, but you know the extended domain names that there are, you know, including the country ones. You know, uh, there are domain names for things like my podcast, for instance, right? The .com was taken, .tv was available. I thought that was wonderful. Obviously, there are people that probably people who own the .com are probably not very thrilled, but .com still has that prime real estate, is it not? It does, but I mean, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the real. As, I, as the bio says, you know, after that, I was trying to do the at-large advisory council. And that was, you know, that was basically supposed to be the real people. But the reality is, how much do you pay for your domain name? Probably $20 a year. You know? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. And it's really, and even if you had 10 of them, it's not worth your time to go to an ICANN meeting. You know, I mean, right. it's like, but it is worth a lawyer's time. It's worth anybody who's in the registry registrar business. And so they go to the meetings and they are the ones who manage the governance because they get money out of the system. But for your average individual, it's just, you know, it's not commercially worth their time. So they're not interested in getting involved in the governance. And because again, they take your money, but not your freedom. Uh, All right. You know, there's, there's, it's like maybe this governance is worth paying a small amount for if you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but you know the, the governance of the metaverse is going to end up being quite fragmented. So the real questions are: What about interoperability? What about your right to take your identity somewhere else? Uh, you know, and you can you can abuse people online in the metaverse. We still need. You know, it's, it's just like people think it's magic and it's safe, but it's not. No, I mean, I, it, it's certainly not. I, I think that, I mean, for, so for, for folks that, uh, that are thinking, expecting a discussion on Oculus Rift or whatever, and we're talking about DNS systems, I think this is a critical point to bring up because I, I think ultimately what we don't want, um, it was, we don't want a metaverse uh, dominated by one company or a handful of small companies, which we kind of saw with social media for good or for bad. I think that what made, I mean, this is me injecting my personal opinion and feel free to disagree with it, anyone, um, panelists or the chat, is what made the internet successful, the web successful, is that it was this kind of 
ungovernable mess um, <laughs> that everybody can kind of put up a website, you know, uh, whether it was at the time I was at barnesandmobile.com uh, or it was just some random guy in uh, Seattle who opened up amazon.com, you know. <laughs> um, hey, hey um, Bruce, do you want to um, get some comments from, take some comments from people in the chat? Or Frank, do you want to read some comments? I, about I, there's a, there's a number of interesting comments. Um, uh, am I right to believe the metaverse might encompass everything from experiences? This is from Gay Ale and K to everyone. Uh, am I right to believe that the metaverse might encompass everything from experiences enclosed in virtual worlds to VR to overlays over real life, AR? NFTs could be leveraged in both ends of the spectrum after all. And if so, I don't know if it is so much to escape from reality as it seems rather poised to be another dimension to real life. That's an interesting point. What do you, what's your thoughts on that, Graham? Well, it's funny you bring up NFTs. Aon is going to be a big player in the space in the future. We are an insurance company, one of the largest insurance companies in the world. And as you know, anybody can take any content and just straight up mint it, mint it an NFT and then start selling it. doesn't matter if they owned that content or not. Their wallet will own the hash of that object. Now, what can you do if you are the original owner of that content or the trademark or whatever? Well, you could file a cease and desist. And on some chains in some countries, some websites that sell these NFTs, they will respect that if they want to keep operating in the U.S., but this is not everywhere, not all the time. So I imagine something similar will occur in the metaverse, where within certain metaverses, there will be some manufactured scarcity of trademarked and copyrighted material. And some metaverses in which will we'll respect that law, and maybe some that won't. And in one that does respect that law, then those objects, those virtual objects will have value and everybody will know it. And everybody will also know that if you're in a metaverse where anybody can you know, make a virtual Gucci bag and it doesn't matter who you are, you didn't have to pay for it, they will also know that has no value there. Now, what's interesting is will humans choose to go to the one where you can do anything or the ones where the virtual objects have value and that's an unknown that's interesting that is interesting i mean with gucci bags for instance you could go to purchase an actual gucci bag or any you know uh new york city there was canal street i don't know if they still do <laughs> there but you could get a, a fake one uh and i guess it all depends on you know the value the perceived value um yeah. i mean that that never I think it's debatable how much that ever affected Gucci's business, but uh, they're still around. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, there's a question here. Um, uh, blockchain identity, let me see towards the top. Uh, this is from Mary Susan Knaus. Uh, what is wrong with wanting a blockchain authoritative digital identity? One versus three pages of logins and passwords at paper wallet cards for social security, Medicare, and a third for drug coverage. Foundational for real time world internet of sapient things. What are your thoughts on that, Esther? Um, there's nothing wrong with it. The, uh, I guess when I'm, you know, it's what are you trying to accomplish? If you're trying to simplify your life, uh, yes, it still points to a bunch of things related to your identity. Some people like that, some people don't like that. Uh, you know, the, the challenge is that just putting it on the blockchain doesn't really solve the big problems. I mean, take, take this issue right now of know your customer. You know, what is, are you related to a sanctioned Russian oligarch? Uh, are you really good for the amount of money you promised? Um, you know, all these things around identity. Again, we need, we need laws and more transparency around who's related to what. And at the other end of this, this sort of spectrum, the fact that I signed something 
and it's on the blockchain, that's good, but it doesn't really show whether or not there was somebody pointing a gun at my head while I did that. And, you know, there's, it's like the blockchain is totally reliable in itself, but the people putting stuff into the blockchain and perhaps the side letters they have, or again, this, the, you know, somebody could blackmail you into doing something on the blockchain that you, you know, it's just, it solves some of the problem. It solves the problem of an irrepudiatable transaction, but it doesn't solve the problem of why that transaction was made and what might have been happening to force the person to, to affect that transaction. And then you get into issues. I mean, we're seeing it right now. You, know, you can record everything in the world, but if a Russian bank is not allowed to send money outside of Russia or a Russian person outside of Russia is not able to get their money that they thought they owned. You know, blockchain isn't going to help that. And I think we, you know, we we kind of imagine that because it is, it's it's like your genome. You know, it's it's something and it's irrefutable, but that doesn't mean it has power in a world where that power is ignored. Um, there seems to be a lot of laughing in the in the comment channel, so I'm not sure what's going on. I think they were laughing about Canal Street. Um, about what? Canal Street buying bootleg items out oh, of Canal Street yes, in New York right. City. Um, the, um, uh, the next question we have is from Mar uh, about human biases and training data being transmitted to the to the metaverse. Yeah. Do you I'll want to take that one, Graham? Yeah. So what you find in machine learning is that machine learning at its very best can learn from data. And your data is usually supervised data. So you have some input and you have a selection that a human made. And then you want to train the system to make that same decision the human made given that same input. Now, of course, this presupposes that all humans were perfect in the past. And we know that we were far from perfect. Now, what would be really sad is if we didn't learn the lessons of all of our biases, not just racism, but everything else, and that we coded them for perpetuity in the AI systems that are governing us. And AI systems are actually affecting our lives in major ways already. I mean, years ago even, they were already using AI to predict Reddit, um, predict who should be released on parole or not. They were, I mean, they've used AI right now to decide which candidates to consider even for a job. And there are features that we can obviously see, things like you know, race, and we don't want to use those, but there's features that are hard to know that the AI is looking at. And those can be things like zip code. And to give you an idea of how AI can go wrong, there was an interesting paper on a husky versus wolf detection system, a classifier. And if you think about it, huskies look a lot like wolves. So it seems like it would be kind of a hard problem. But lo and behold, this detector was able to classify them with 99% accuracy and everybody was all happy, great, all right. Then someone dug in a little bit deeper and said, okay, show me the pixels in the image that were used to make this classification. And whenever it classified a wolf as a wolf, the pixels it was looking at was the snow in the background. It wasn't even looking at the animal. Now, that kind of thing can happen looking at you know, resumes or looking at personal characteristics or financial data, things that we as a human, you know, as humans, we would say that shouldn't affect it. The AI doesn't care what should or shouldn't affect it. It's going to look at whatever it can, it can get to. And whatever biases we have in our data that we don't even know are there because they're too complex for us to understand, those biases can be brought into the metaverse. 
Now, we might want to start over from scratch in the metaverse and try to make it like a meritocracy. Now we're talking about civilization building. Let's talk about that for a second. The metaverse gives us the ability to try things out that we could never have time to try out in the real world. If you think about SimCity, SimCity was the first program that I really could have gotten addicted to. SimCity One had it on, I think, the Atari 2600 computer. And first night, I'm going to go play it. After dinner, I sit down and I start playing it. Then about an hour later, my mom walks in and says, are you ready? The bus comes in five minutes. I had played all night and I didn't even know it. So SimCity you know, lets you try out different buildings and structures and see if it works for your city. What if you could do that with everything in life? What if city planners could do this? What if you could do this for whole economies? What if, you know, Jerome Powell could say, okay, I have a virtual America here. I'm going to see what happens over the next six months if I either do or do not increase rates. There's a lot you could do by simulating out the civilization we already have. But what about trying entirely new ones from scratch? We've only recreated civilization from scratch like 22 times in, hist in human history. We have another chance to do it again. In fact, we could do a thousand of them at the same time. There's gonna be a lot of experimentation and each one of them, hopefully, we can leave our biases behind, but I do think we'll make new ones. Um, but what are you going to make them of? Because if you make them of real people, what do you do at the end? Do you kill them off or you know, pick the best one? Or I mean, well, how many people how many people use Linden dollars and go to what was that world called? Real world, real life, life two? Second life. Yeah, second life. So I think the way it dies off is people get bored and go somewhere else. Um, right. But then, I mean, that's not a simulation. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, yes, people, I mean, the good thing about metaverses is it's much easier to leave than it, to leave, for example, Ukraine or Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, though, I mean, what if, I mean, my, uh, my younger son was banned off of a Roblox game for 24 hours, and, yeah. and he's only seven or eight, and uh, to him, that was, that was devastating. Okay, but that's, mm. I said, easier to leave, not easier to be. Right, yeah. fair enough. I, and I think, honestly, that the value of metaverses, ideally, is they will compete to attract people. The problem is they may attract people who, you know, are attracted. I mean, yeah, you know, they may attract bad people who then start doing really bad things as we've seen with some of the, mm -hmm. you know, QAnon kinds of things or you know, any group that wants to get together to wreak mayhem or maybe destroy a different metaverse. You know, how do we prevent that from happening? And again, it gets back to human beings and governance and yeah, kind of social contracts. Think about so the, the different blockchains. People? Well, think about the different blockchains that are out there. Every one of them has different rules, different code that underlies it. And yeah. I remember there was one, it was trying to pattern itself after Doge. They called it Hose. And they said, you know what? We're going to tweak the parameters just a little bit so that every time you take money out, you lose 1% and it gets distributed to everybody else. And they had their, this idea that the complex system dynamics were gonna be amazing. It was gonna be wonderful. And it was just gonna go up in value forever. And it did not. And the best laid plans, even by really smart people, do not work out the way you think it should because complex system dynamics are so unpredictable. And the only thing we can do is try out different kinds of civilization again and again and again. That's kind of what we're already doing Every state has its own slightly different rules. Every country has its different rules. We're already doing experimentation, but we're not doing it fast enough. I think the metaverse could help us figure out some things for real governance in the real world. Hmm, interesting. So um, speed up the, the, the pace. The of metaverse, sorry, 
Um, I don't think the metaverse is a simulation. That was sort of exactly what I was saying to Graham, that they're actually, you know, they're real things. They may simulate some of, you know, some physical things, but they're real virtual places that people live in, which is why you, you want to be careful about what happens in them. Sorry, go ahead, Frank. No, no, I cut you off, so just uh, oh, that's all. <laughs> um, no, so, so do you think speeding up the, the, the iteration cycle will help us get to a better, better place? I think it'll help us figure out different ways to cooperate. I mean, in the metaverse, we're assuming people will have needs and desires, and there will be some resources that are limited and others that are unlimited. And in some ways, that maps onto the real world. So we can try out different governance structures with at very cheaply. You don't have to find new land and populate it with people. You can just make it. And encourage people to come. Yeah. And if people come and if it thrives, then you can in some way say it's a success. Now, whether or not that success means that governance structure will also work in the real world, totally separate question. Or well, there's the a chance. People. I mean, mm -hmm. whether or not it were put in the real world, it's, it's more like, is it is that model replicable among many more sets of people? Mm -hmm. So Frank, do you want to go ahead and start um, talking more about some of the comments that people are saying? Yes. It's um, a, little bit, a little bit hard to follow. Um, what there's a saying. lot. It, it's always good to have an engaged audience. Uh, the downside is that there's a lot of comments to read. We're, we're um, a metaverse here. It's very meta. <laughs> um, uh, an interesting question. So Musk has now just acquired the best source of training data ever with the Twitter acquisition. I always thought Gmail was the best uh, source of training data, but what are your thoughts on that, Esther, uh, Graham? Well, Twitter's public, Gmail is not in theory. So, yeah. Um, Fair enough. But again, Twitter is a very small subset of the real world. That's true. A very loud subset. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I there's some people who just, I don't know if they have time to do anything other than tweet. Yeah, I enjoy Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Now, Frank, you said training data. Training data for what? For what purpose? Uh, that was the question was from Mary Susan uh, now, so maybe she can explain what that is. I'm assuming NLP models, models um, but um, she'll have to let us know if that's what she meant. Um, so I'd like to point out that language, things you say and write, is really just a byproduct of the human communication game. So let's say I say something to you. It could be partly because I have a thought in my head that I want to convey 100% accurately to your head, but there could be other things going on. I could be signaling socially to other people that are hearing. I could be trying to manipulate you. I could be trying to be vague. There's so many things that could be going on. So if you yeah. want to get trained data to understand what what brains are doing, there's a lot more than just the language. Yeah, I like to say one of the hardest uh, phrases to actually understand the true meaning of is, yes, let's have lunch sometime. <laughs> you know, like, are you being totally blown off or are you being invited on a date or are you, you know, being invited to buy life insurance from Aon? <laughs> I can give you a definite maybe on that. <laughs> the next question is from Tom J. Esther, do you, why do you think the metaverse is a simulation of anything? Um, I don't. I, 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 was, I think I was responding again to Graham's comment about simulations in the metaverse. It's, it's, it's more like, what's the word, um, you know, entities of different instantiations of models rather than exactly simulations. Interesting. Uh, this next comment is from Kim. We need a new study called Tech, tech Ethics. Uh, no new, no every, new new technology should be available, uh, all new technology should be available to the world, you know, limited uses. 
I do. What are your thoughts on on on, on what what sorts of ethical conundrums does the 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 metaverse bring? I'm guessing a lot. Well, first of all, it could turn up to eleven all the issues that we have with people touching their smartphones all the time. Those little dopamine hits. Yeah, I mean, it's put it this way: it's really scary to you know go to any advertising conference, and they are now kind of like Robin Hood, just with with no how shall we say no shame talking about making things addictive and you know addiction is basically it sort of starts as a search for pleasure but then it ends up as a craving for relief that can never be satisfied and it's extremely lucrative for the people selling whatever it is that people crave but it creates wow. an epidemic of addiction short-term thinking distraction and you know incredibly unhappy people some of whom kill themselves so, sounds a lot like the tobacco industry in terms of them intentionally yeah. making their product but robin hood is another example uh, a lot of the you know the food companies are selling food that's bad for you but that you like you keep eating more because you get hungry for sugar and I mean, it's, but the problem, I mean, I, I seriously worry about the future of humanity. You know, are we becoming so good at addicting other people that we're going to basically destroy ourselves? You know, is any sufficiently intelligent society going to figure out how to make money to which people are also addicted and they're addicted to, you know, sort of the false scarcity and, and, Things like NFTs, in a sense, are an attempt to recreate Gucci bags. I mean, the, the purpose of NFTs is, you know, digital allows you to duplicate things and share them with everybody. And then NFTs kind of takes that all back and says, no, we're going to make these unique and we're going to bid up the price and make people want them. Reintroduction of scarcity. Yes. Whether or not that's a good thing will. Well, remains to be seen. Um, I think it's pretty much a, a bad thing. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, of all the, I mean, there is some case. I mean, mostly I think it's bad, but there is some case for artists being able to be compensated. I, I understand that well, angle, but uh, fake scarcity. You know, real art is right. is unique. That's true. Uh, here's a question from Helen Sned. Uh, how will how on how virtual gaming will influence the relationship between people in our society? I didn't understand everything you said. How virtual oh, gaming will what uh, influence the relationship between people in our society? In the metaverse, one thing people can do they can't do in real life is change their skin and appearance and everything about themselves. There's a, that's definitely going to affect, I think, how they, how we will feel when we interact with people in the real world. And some of us, I think, are going to react by saying, I'm just not going to do it. I want to stay in the real world and stay happy in my body and who I am. And there are going to be others that I think are going to go very far in the other direction and only interact with people online. Um, some countries have this more than others. There are definitely a lot of countries where people, especially after the pandemic, are more introvert than they were before. And they love interacting online and they're perfectly happy just strolling through Instagram all day. Something like that will happen on the metaverse. Um, I would argue most of them are not perfectly happy scrolling <laughs> through all day. They've been yeah, addicted to point. something. I mean, the, the challenge is, you know, uh, even as in some sectors we're, we're trying to, you know, stop fat shaming, eliminate racism, so forth and so on. In the metaverse, there's, you can sort of 
get absorbed by these false notions of perfection or you know complete fantasy and I'm not sure it's good for real people who still have physical bodies to be so engrossed in, in a world where, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just creating too, you know, reality is actually kind of healthy for the human psyche, I think. Mm -hmm. It's what our neural networks are trained on, reality. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And let's hope the next generation is also trained on reality and not something else. That's an interesting point. So, so really getting back to governance, um, um, who do you think is going to run this? I mean, do you think it'll be kind of this decentralized, multifaceted, uh, different metaverses for different folks? Uh, or do you think that this is going to be, uh, is this going to be governed by somebody like Putin or Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg. One day what there's going to be there's going to be as many metaverses one day as there are websites now. Interesting. Yeah, but in terms of which ones are most visited, I mean, yeah, it, again there are sort of these natural monopolies. Um, I mean, it's going to be a very you know fat front, long tail kind of thing. But the fat front is going to be where all the money is and where, you know, it, I mean, I think the good news seems to be that Facebook, whatever it is, is facing, you know, the thing that really destroys most of these things is time and something new coming along that's more attractive rather than, you know, governance. It's fashion kills them. And I mean, I'm a big believer in evolution, whether it's of species or metaverses. Yeah, if they get too big and die a natural death, that's probably good. That's, that's an interesting point, sir. I think, I think back to kind of social networking, right? It really started with MySpace. MySpace kind of did the dinosaur thing. And uh, then, then, then that begat the whole generation of what, what we have now. Are they coming to the end of life? And is this really Mark Zuckerberg having an aha moment thinking, you know, we're going to face our, our demise unless we pivot? It sure looks like it. Interesting. Yeah, TikTok. TikTok is definitely taking the world by storm, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, Here's a comment from Bonnie. Lest we forget, mental health issues will weigh up as we spend more time online when we were forced to. Uh, I mean, that definitely, I think one of the, the unintended consequences of the, of the last two years is going to be kind of what are the long-term mental health effects. And um, uh, I think that that's going to be more and more of a serious concern, I think. I think. What, what are your thoughts? Um, yes. I mean, it's, you know, again, whether you want to blame online or you want to blame people, I think the, the impact of the internet and of, you know, whatever social distancing, seeing other people, you know, it's being really, mental health issues are huge now among young people. It's scary and depression, suicidal thoughts, everything else is, you know, it's off the charts and terrifying. And we're not paying enough attention to it. Frank, I think we have time for one more question or All one right. more comment. So uh, here's an interesting part. And I think this is, this kind of ties in some other things that we saw that uh, MMOs or massively online uh, games, I know I'm not getting that acronym right, uh, are a great glance at some examples of what might unfold regarding human behavior in a type of metaverse, especially some of the older ones in the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, do you think, I mean, I would argue that MMOs and multi, uh, MMORs, or I, I'm not in that space anymore, but 
are they kind of a preview of what's to come with the metaverse, like those type of gaming communities? Absolutely. I mean, there would just be an added level of realism. I mean, the metaverse, as you all know, it's it's not really a new invention. It's just a high, more high definition version of what we've had for many, many years. And it's gonna become more realistic. You're gonna be able to experience it in a 3D. Um, there may even be you know, ways to connect your Neuralink to it someday. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, everyone, for um, coming. We always wrap up really tightly right at seven. So um, thank you for coming. Our next webinar will maybe be a joint in-person Microsoft event. It's been two years since we've been in person at Microsoft, and I think people are getting ready to go back. And um, so they've already great. asked if we can start doing it again. So I'll let you know, but I think it'll still be a hybrid. I don't know whether people are really ready to go back full time. I don't know how many people would show up to a large conference now or not, but we'll let you know and I'll keep you posted on um, Meetup. And if you have any other questions that you want answered that weren't answered here, or if we missed any questions that weren't answered here, feel free to let us know on uh, Meetup, or you can always go to info at disruptive technologists with an s.com and we will get back to you with answers to that and to our last session with Vince Cerf two weeks ago we're still compiling questions and answers for that thank you everyone for joining us we love our members we love disruptors have a great evening and um we'll see you in a couple of weeks bye-bye thank you everyone take care